Croeso mawr yr dosbarth meistr pnaw mae The Veterinary Science Masterclass. Ac mae gan ei ddau feistr omlani. I have two masters in front of me. So, Christiane, I'll start with you. Tell us who you are. Hi there. Good, good, good day, everybody. Um, so, I'm Christiane Glossop, and I'm the, the Chief Veterinary Officer for Wales. Um, I'm a qualified vet, qualified at the Royal Veterinary College in London, and have, well, we'll talk about it later, I'm sure, but I have been a proper vet, and now I work for government. Thank you. Diolch, yeah, Christian. Daniel. Thank you. My name's Daryl Abernethy, and I'm the head and chair of the Aberystwyth School of Veterinary Science. We call it Abervet School, just to be short, um, but I've been appointed since the 1st of April um, to lead the new school. By background, I qualified in South Africa. You'll hear my, my accent's not exactly Welsh, um, but I've worked for several decades uh, in Northern Ireland, so I'm well used to working in the UK. I just love the accents, and we could talk a lot about that, but that's not the purpose of this masterclass. So um, what I want to ask both of you, where did you train as a vet? I'll start with yourself, Daryl, this time. Okay. So I graduated from the veterinary school in South Africa. I of typical colonial stock. I lived most of my life in Africa when I was doing my schooling, some of it in Northern Ireland. That's where my parents came from. But I finished my schooling and then studied veterinary science in South Africa. There's only one faculty. It's very similar to the UK schools. It's accredited with the UK schools. So it's much the same um, as graduating here. Mm. And so I qualified at the Royal Veterinary College in London, which has a very important link, of course, with Aberystwyth, um, because the veterinary education that's going to be provided in Aberystwyth um, is, is connected. It's, it's integrated um, in with uh, what's happening in London. Not that I'm biased in any way, of course, but uh, growing up in Torbay in Devon in England, um, uh, I set my heart on going to London. It was then part of the University of London, although, of course, it's now a standalone veterinary college. Well, I have to be careful here. I'm an alumni of Aberystwyth and spent some <laughs> wonderful years there. So we've got to be very careful that we're not too pro Aberystwyth, whether <laughs> you can do that or not. I'm not quite sure. But carry on with, with that story about you then, Christian. Um, why did you want to become a vet? Yeah, I don't come from a farming background. Um, I grew up by the sea. My parents ran a small guest house in Torbay. And I think it, and it predates all the um, Shouldn't Happen to a Vet series, all those books. It's before then. But I was always interested in animals. And when I was 13, I was pestering my mother. I want to be a vet. I want to be a vet. And she took me up the road to the local vet practice. Um, and asked if I could sleep a sweep their floor for a day, just to have a look at what was happening there. And I was very blessed and fortunate to meet a wonderful uh, vet there who took me under his wing, Jim Goodwin. He became my friend and my mentor at 13. And he's still my friend and my mentor today. And, uh, you know, I'll forever be grateful to him. Believe it or not, when I first met him, um, I couldn't string a sentence together. I was very, very shy. And uh, every day that I went out with him in his car, looking at cattle and sheep and pigs and so on, he would have a pre-arranged list of questions to ask me because he was so worried about trying to have a conversation with me. Now, as you will find out, probably in the next 40 minutes or so, difficult to stop me talking. Oh, there's two of us then. <laughs> Dan, what about you? So I came into veterinary science by a rather unusual route in the sense that when I was um, a youngster growing up in, in South Africa, I was very interested in birds. And from the age of about 11, I was engaged every weekend with a friend doing bird watching. We used to watch birds at a large sewage treatment works, a large series of pans. It's not the nicest place, but it's beautiful for birds. There are tens of thousands of all types of ducks and waders and waterfowl on it. And they developed a disease called botulism. And this disease paralyzed birds by their thousands. And this friend and myself used to go and collect the sick birds, take them to a lady to be treated. There's not much you can do with birds when they've got this disease. They get paralyzed. Most of them die. But she would do her best to help them. And then I got interested in research. So we used to identify all these little waders, these little birds that run along the shoreline. 
Um, some of them, we've got still got the records for the first record in Southern Africa of these rare birds. That developed an interest in research. And by the time I was 13, I was very involved with the local university. So I wanted to do research. And my mother, being of her generation, said to me, don't be silly. You can't get a career watching birds. Go and do something that puts money on the table. And she said, do vet science. And that's what I did. And so I now watch birds. In fact, I now get paid to do research on bird diseases. So that's how I got into veterinary science. So it seems that you've hit the jackpot there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what, and what that says to our, our listeners uh, this evening is, or this afternoon, I should say, that, you know, there are different paths. There are different reasons for people wanting to pursue any career path. But it's really interesting to hear the differences with your experiences. Now, I've got to ask a question that students have asked us. And it's a question that my dad always wanted to ask me. Is it more difficult to become a vet than a doctor? You could see that coming, couldn't you? Um, I'll go ladies first. Yeah. And, um, you know, on the one hand, you can't have a conversation with an animal, not a verbal conversation to ask them how they're feeling. And there's there is a drawback that if you ask the owner, they may not have very good observation skills or they may not be completely telling telling the truth. I've been in situations in practice where um, somebody, you know, I would ask someone, how long has your dog been? And the, the owner would say, oh, it just started today. And the child would be tugging onto their father's jacket and said, but daddy, daddy, don't you remember? He's been sick for over a week. And so, you know, you have to try and get the truth out of the owner. But of course, the symptoms that an animal can show you don't lie. You can look at the symptoms, very, very basic questions you can ask of the animal without using words. And therefore, you're in a position where you can, you can make your best veterinary judgment. Of course, the other facet to this is that you're dealing with many different species. We've just heard Daryl talk about his passion and interest for birds. And dealing with a bird is a very different matter than dealing with a, with a dog or a cat or a cow. So I think in the basic veterinary course where you have to start learning anatomy and physiology of so many different types of animal, that can be the challenge. But I personally don't think it's more difficult being a vet. It's just different. I don't know what you think, Daryl. Uh, yeah, I, Christian, I agree fully with you. Um, I think, Glenda, to be fair, if you asked any vet, they would always say their course is more difficult. <laughs> you know, that's just nature. But yes, I think they're very similar. I think the challenge, though, for veterinary is very much around. I'll give you one example. I was in a game reserve in South Africa um, last year, and I was helping a colleague. I was actually observing a colleague working on elephants. And I had just come from a research project where we were catching small birds and taking blood samples to look for diseases. The birds were about four centimeters long. And I went from little birds in the morning to working with elephants in the afternoon. So that's scale. Now that's quite unusual, quite, quite rare, but it does illustrate the enormous variety that you get. A mixed practice vet might deal with the cow in the morning, go back into the practice, have hamsters or mm -hmm. gerbils or chickens, and that variety, and that just makes the course that little bit more complicated. Uh, Different, but certainly, I think, better. I have to admit my prejudice. I think we're well, all biased. <laughs> well, let's concentrate on those positives. What is? What are the best things about being a vet? We, we're just getting your enthusiasm right around us this afternoon. So what's the best thing about it? Uh, gentlemen, first this time. Okay. I have to tell you, for me, and, and I meet with students often, and one of the questions, particularly first year students says, I want to work with wildlife, or I want to work with dogs and cats, or I want to work with horses. And they get nervous because they're then confronted with species that they're not used to. And they say, you know, what, what, why should I do that? And I think one of the things that I always tell them is it's an enormous privilege to have this variety of careers and to be open to any of them. So you can work with cats and dogs if that's what you wish to do. You can work with farm animals. You can go and work for government. There's an increasing number of vets having very deep and meaningful careers in government or in the pharmaceutical industry or people like me who have a greater interest in research. So that simple fact that it's very transferable, you can go most countries of the world and work very easily in a huge variety of settings, Ultimately, though, what I find most satisfying 
is we're still working with people. And for me, working with people is hugely valuable. And treating somebody's dog or saving animals on a farm or working in conservation, um, you can't beat it. Fantastic. Mm. I mean, yeah. I completely agree with you, Daryl. There's a huge variety. And at very least, what you've got with a veterinary degree is a very good science degree. And that opens doors in its own right. Um, and yet you've got so much more as well because it's a vocational training. So it's not just the straight science. You're actually interacting, as, uh, as Daryl said, with, with people as well as with animals. There's huge variety and you can make a genuine difference, whether that's at a one animal level. And that in itself is a really important thing. When you think about how much people care about their animals, um, you can become sort of part of the family of supporting them if their animal is sick. Um, even if someone's planning to get a new puppy, you can get involved at that level, support them with their choices and to guide them along their way. Get involved in food animal uh, veterinary medicine, they are actually help, helping to feed the nation. And that's a massively important thing to do. And, you know, at farm level, the farmer vet interface is the absolute unit of improving performance, productivity, quality of the product. If you then extrapolate that out into what those products are going to do, you're supporting trade within the United Kingdom. And right now, at this critical time when we're leaving the EU, veterinary assurance of health and welfare is absolutely vital to underpin those trade negotiations. We're, we're feeding into those in terms of, of the quality and the, and the safety of products. You're also at that point right in the middle of protecting public health. So it's not just about dealing with the animals as if that wasn't enough, but you're also protecting public health. Right now, we're very involved with the whole COVID-19 response, because as you may have picked up on the news, there, um, there have been some um, reports of animals catching COVID-19 from their owners. It's quite rare, but there have been reports. But more importantly, in the last few weeks or last few months, we've been looking at infection of mink in various parts of Europe and the United States. And although we don't have mink farming here in the United Kingdom, and we don't, people don't tend to have pet minks, they don't make great pets, other, other pets are available, um, uh, we do keep ferrets. And ferrets are part of the same family group as mink. So, you know, you might think the COVID-19 response is all about the medics and the National Health Service. Well, there we are in the middle of Welsh government providing advice and guidance to the Chief Medical Officer and the First Minister on how we should be approaching this potential source of infection in ferrets. So, you know, that goes from the one animal that you deal with in the surgery all the way through to um, population medicine and advising governments. And that's what I find so fascinating about this, this, this career, that um, there are so many things you can be doing and so many more besides that. You know, that's actually my kind of career path. And it's been fascinating so far, not over yet. <laughs> and who would have thought that you'd have actually been doing that kind of work when you started off in both your careers? Um, it's quite incredible, really. But we have to cover the whole side of, of the science in particular. What are the downsides of your careers or being a veterinary scientist? Mm -hmm. shall, I, shall I kick off with that? Um, I think, um, you know, the, the there, there's the emotional, it, it's emotionally draining at times. You can be dealing with a very difficult case or complex um, problem on a farm. I get very involved with the control and eradication, for example, of bovine tuberculosis. Now, I do that because I'm passionate about seeing TB eradicated from Wales and, and, and the wider uh, United Kingdom. But there's also, for every single case of bovine TB, there's a, there's a family, there's, there's real people that are affected by that. So, you know, you could see that as a as a downside that you're dealing with the emotional side. If someone's dog is very sick and maybe has to be put down, but you can turn that into a positive because what you can do is be the best you can be at dealing with the people as well as the animals. Um, and then what I find is you might be um, absolutely fine when you're out there interfacing with them, but you pay the price when you come home. You can, you can, you can be exhausted at the end of the day. You might be on night call. Um, and, and that's hard to do as well. Although actually there are a lot of practices now that have very special arrangements for providing 24 hour cover, which do 
two enabled vets fit to get a night's sleep. I remember when I was a young vet in small animal practice and um, there was a, um, a, a corgi fit that was whelping. She was having her puppies and um, I checked her in the morning and then she'd gone home and I was on call that night. And this lady rang me. It was the first litter she'd ever seen born. She rang me for every single puppy and there were about 10 of them. And I had phone calls all through the night. And in the end, I, and, and I didn't have a mobile phone. This is before mobile. So I was literally getting out of bed to answer these calls. And I remember coming back into bed and saying to my husband, I am so sorry. If I get one more call, I'm going out there. I may as well be with her. He said, in his sleep, it's all right. I married you for better or worse. Oh. Is worse. <laughs> oh, good man, but yeah. so brave. But yes, yeah, so married to him. Can I ask, did you charge her for every puppy as a separate consultation? <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? That is the problem. And in the morning, she was there, bright, bright eyed and bushy tailed at the surgery, to have those poor little puppies' tails docked. It's a different subject. I don't agree with tail docking. I withdrew and someone else had to dock their tails because I've, I've never, ever agreed with that. But that might be a subject that comes up later, Glenda. <laughs> Yes, and the money makers listening in to us today are thinking, oh, how much did that give her in her pocket, I wonder? Not enough. <laughs> Dad, are there any downsides for you as a vet? I mean, agree entirely with what Christiane said. That's that She's put it very well. And maybe I'll just raise a little bit of a red flag here, because sometimes when um, people apply to do vet science, it's because they're very influenced by the TV vet type programs, which are wonderful but it must be given with a health warning that it only describes part of a vet's life and very often the glamorous ones. It doesn't make good TV to see vets working long hours throughout the night or dealing with disappointing cases or dealing with the frustrations or the time pressures. So a little warning here, I tell this to all people who are interested in applying for vet science, is try and get a very balanced view. That's why most vet schools will ask students before they apply, they must do work experience, not only at a vet practice, but they must go and see what an abattoir looks like. They must be exposed to things like the RSPCAs or to the other rehabilitation centers and to government vet. So they get a good idea of the variety of vets because it is a truism in our profession that three to five years after graduating, many vets change direction. Sometimes it might be within the profession that they go from working with small animals to farm animals or vice versa. Some of them become disillusioned and they leave the veterinary profession altogether. And we're working strongly on trying to understand why that is. I think not all the story, but part of the story is we're not selecting the right veterinary applicants making sure that they have the right understanding of veterinary science before they apply. So there is a downside to the profession. We, I mean, you can only listen to Christiana and you can see her enthusiasm and I'm passionate about it too. But we do recognize both of us in our respective disciplines that there are a downside or there are downsides that people must be aware of. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, let's follow on that course then. So should somebody follow this career pathway and then decide, no, it's not for them, where could they go? What are the options available to somebody who has these qualifications? I'll start with you, Daryl, this time. Okay, so there's two possible directions. The one we already mentioned, which is that they can stay within the veterinary profession. And because it's so varied, they can change direction quite significantly. So you'll find, for example, a, there's a vet working on a farm. And maybe it's a, a young married vet or a young um, vet who's got two, three children and she wants to spend more time with the kids and the unsociable hours are very difficult. So what she might choose to do is to move more into small animal practice where maybe the hours are more regular. She might do part time practice so she can juggle those very difficult and time consuming parts of her career. Some people will go into industry or government type of jobs that have more regular hours. So they work maybe in a university where they teach students. So they don't have that pressurized nightlife and the pressurized after hours service, and they can manage their time more effectively. Some people leave the veterinary profession 
And sometimes they leave it all together. They do. I have got a, a good friend of mine who studied with me, and today he's a potter in England. Now, I personally think he might be a bit potty, excuse the pun, <laughs> um, but that's his choice and brilliant. And very many of our veterinary students are very gifted musicians and artists, and they very often go to those professions. They work part time as a vet science, but they've now moved into that. And that's quite legitimate. Some questions I get asked about in terms of, all that money that government and they've invested in their career and are they wasting it? No, that's their right to choose their career. But some other people will change direction. Maybe they will go into the biological sciences. Maybe they will go into farm management or animal management or animal handling. So there's a huge variety in what we could call almost the para-veterinary professions that require veterinary skills or require knowledge about animals, but they're not directly related to being a vet. You've just reminded me of this wonderful vet we had in West Wales years ago, and his passion was folk dancing. So he would do that by night with his community and then do his day job at the other time. But you've just reminded me of him and he was a close friend of the family. What about you, Christiane? Well, I, you know, I, I think it's it's correct that um, because of the qualification you've got and, you know, we're talking five years of intensive scientific study along with a lot of problem solving and, um, you know, tackling different different challenges that, um, uh, you know, first of all, I would look within the profession for a change. That's what I would do first, because I value my veterinary degree. And I remember that little girl of 13 that was passionate about being a vet. And I, I remind myself of her when, you know, I'm maybe having a difficult day or I'm wondering what to do next. Um, so I would definitely look within the profession first. But we need vets in all places. They have such key roles to play. People with that kind of grounding, that kind of training can contribute so meaningfully at so many levels of society. And we have a veterinary surgeon in the House of Lords. And that is really, really important because we need people in the heart of government that have got that understanding. You know, it's not unusual to have a medic in, in, in Parliament, either as, a, as, as you know, in Welsh Government or in, in um, Westminster Government. But the notion of having a vet there is always uh, seems a bit novel. And yet we need them at that place, not just to argue for the animals or for veterinary matters, but because of the background and everything that they bring with them. So I would definitely look within that first. And if, if I think about my own career, um, I did my PhD and then um, I was expecting my first child and I was really trying to decide what, you know, what, what would be my career and my passion, was large animal medicine and in particular uh, reproduction in cattle and pigs. That was that was the first half of my career. That's what I, I devoted it to. Um, but um, while I was pregnant, I went and I did some small animal practice. And I'm really glad I did that because that, that brought me that interface with people. I haven't properly had before and you know I didn't really want to let that side of, of the possibilities go without trying it now it, it wasn't something that I knew I would spend my career doing I'm so glad I gave it a go and I'm so glad that I've been able over the years to do practice I've been I've been able to do research I've done some teaching I've worked in industry traveled all over the world I haven't lived anywhere else um, but I have travelled widely with my work. And when I think about the opportunities that it's given me, um, I would never have thought of deviating from the veterinary profession. I think it's rich enough as it is. But I do agree with Daryl that, you know, there are other avenues if, if you want to follow them. And I know when I'm talking to prospective veterinary students and they start completing all that dreadful paperwork that Daryl knows much more about <laughs> than I do to try and get into veterinary school. In fact, it's probably virtual paperwork, isn't it? It's probably all, all online. Um, and it, it, you have to ask the question, what makes you stand out alongside all the others of the same age, probably very similar backgrounds, that all have set their heart on being a vet? And actually, um, it's going to be those other things that you do the sport that you play you know are you a team player because if you can play in a rugby team or a, or a basketball team that shows that you can work in a team and within the veterinary profession you are working in a team on many occasions but 
you know, if you're a musician, if you've got something about you that, that um, creates performance and demonstrates the discipline of practicing, of studying, of, you know, being determined to, to get through the next exam or get ready for the next uh, performance, that shows a skill set that is also directly relevant to being a veterinary surgeon. So, or if you're autistic, you know, it's, it's really important for everyone, not just to be so single minded that when they go into that interview for vet school, all they've got to talk about is that they love animals and they want to work with them. You know, you need to back up a bit and have other, other skills and then they can help fulfill and enrich your career whilst you progress as a veterinary surgeon. Brilliant. A question that some young people are probably asking themselves, can one be a vet and a vegan? Different kind of questions. What's your <laughs> response to that? It's bringing out a lot of laughter anyway. Ab that is absolutely. No, go, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. <laughs> I'll go second. A absolutely. I mean, there's no reason why vegetarians and vegans can't become vets. There is a however. And the however is this. We as vets work, Christiane, myself, all vets in this country, work under the authority of what's called the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. They oversee the profession. And what they do is they produce a set of guidelines called the day one competencies. And this is what people in vet schools like myself work to, that when students graduate, they must be able to fulfill these competencies. And those competencies are as wide ranging as we talked about the variety of work that a vet does. If you're a vegan and you have a point of principle that you will not work, for example, with caged hens, or you will not work um, in terms of putting animals to sleep if they need to be sleep, or you're going to work in government and you refuse to cull animals under certain circumstances, you may then infringe those day one competencies. And that's a very important point. I've had students in my previous vet school where I worked refuse to do, for example, meat inspection in an abattoir. They said, we're against slaughter of animals for food. We're not going to go into the abattoir. And therefore, they couldn't fulfill the day one competencies that they were required to do. So absolutely, we have people of all different persuasions, disciplines and principles. But it does come with that little health warning that if a student cannot fulfill the day one competencies, they can't graduate. So if you are a vegan and you do have those principles, you're entitled to them 100%. But just think carefully before you apply and make sure you're comfortable with what the implications of being a vet are all about. Mm, that's a they're really important points. And, uh, you know, what I was thinking as you were talking, Daryl, was that, of course, once you've got through those competences, once you've demonstrated your ability by taking your exams and, and so on, you can choose the course that you that you follow. Um, you are still a veterinary surgeon and you still have, have a voice. But you could choose to work in small animal practice with wildlife. You could, you could make that choice, but you do have to have those basic competences. And I was kind of thinking also around the fact that, you know, as veterinary surgeons, it's part of our role is, in fact, the most important thing we do is to promote the highest standards of animal health and welfare. And so for an animal that is going to be used um, to produce food for us, whether that is um, in terms of a product of the animal while it lives, so milk or eggs, um, or if it's going to be put into the to the food chain as uh, producing meat or meat products. You know, I see a really important role for the vet to stand up for the health and welfare of that animal, because from the moment it's born, in fact, before it's born, all the way through to the point that it is slaughtered, it, it not only deserves, but it's enshrined in legislation that the welfare of that animal will be protected and promoted. And so, you know, you have to be realistic about it. If we're going to have cattle and sheep, and pigs and poultry, we have them, we keep them, not just for enjoyment. You wouldn't have fields full of cattle in Great Britain if you didn't use the product. They're not quite big pets, aren't they? You'd probably go for a smaller pet if you're going to have one. But the vet can make absolutely sure that the standards that that animal has been subjected to, the conditions are as good as they can be. And you know, so you might 
we may not agree with um, with, with um, eating the meat or the products from that animal, but you can still in some way promote and protect those standards. I used to visit a pig farmer um, in the Midlands um, every three months, and he was a vegetarian, and so was his wife. And I found that astonishing. It's like, how can you farm pigs if you are a vegetarian? When talking to him quietly when his wife wasn't around, I realized that it was his wife that was a vegetarian and he was kind of connected to that. But his wife said to me, I don't agree with the way pigs are kept. And yet her children had been educated on the proceeds of, of, the, of the farm that involved pigs being kept and slaughtered. And, and yet, um, you know, I, I said to her, but you've got control of the standards that your pigs are being kept on. It was, it was a very complicated conversation. But, you know, I, I think it's ever so important that we accept the fact animals are not just as pets, not just to look nice in the fields and flying overhead. They're here for other reasons. And we as veterinary surgeons have a critical role to play in making sure that they're kept as well as possible. Um, but if you have a fundamental problem with farming per se, then being a food animal vet is probably not, not, not the career for you. But you can still have a very fulfilling career in other aspects. Um, so once again, it's demonstrating the versatility of the, uh, of the course. However, Daryl is bang on right. There are things you have to know how to do on the day you qualify. And you're going to have to have to accept that, basically. Thank you for that. Well, there's a question now specifically about Aberystwyth. So I'm going to go local. The question is, I live near Aberystwyth and can live at home if I studied Aberystwyth. I worry about the cost of studying in London for three years. When will it be possible to do all five years of the vet course at Aberystwyth? Who's listening? Oh, what a dream. What an ambition. I would love for us to have a complete vet school at Aberystwyth. Two points to bear in mind. First of all, this degree has been um, introduced and initiated through an agreement with the Royal Vet College, as we've already discussed. We have an agreement with them for 10 years that governs it. So that's our starting point, that for the next 10 years, um, we will run our program for two years. We may be able to expand the number of students. We may be able to expand the number of years, but that's for the next 10 years. But that's going to give us lots of opportunity to think how we could have a fully functioning well school. Here's the downside. The downside is the justification. It's hugely expensive to run a vet school. We don't have to necessarily do all the training on our campus. We could use practices to help us, but whatever model we do, it's very expensive. The reason is, well, just let me digress for a moment. Veterinary faculties or schools in any university are by far the most expensive faculty or school. And there's two reasons. One is they have limited number of students. If I want to do, let's say, an accounting degree, I can go into a class of maybe 600, 700 students with a lecturer to teach me. In vet science, we are very constrained that when we do the clinical work, we can't have a ratio of more than one lecturer to about seven or eight students. So we have small classes and then we have very expensive professionals. You have to have an eye surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon, an animal medicine specialist. These people could get big money in private practice. To be competitive, universities have to pay them. And that makes vet schools very expensive. What we're going to do, probably in years three to five, is to really start to explore the case for a full veterinary faculty in Wales. And we want to think out of the box. So we don't want to think of, we're going to build an animal hospital in Aberystwyth. We're going to build all the facilities here. But maybe we could link with other universities. Aberystwyth has got huge strengths like in livestock production, in cattle. So the veterinary students could come to us for their cattle production and go to like RVC or somewhere else for their small animal work. So we probably won't have all the training done at Aberystwyth. But I would love to see the day where we have, as part of an Aberystwyth degree program, the full thing. Watch the space. 
Yeah, I, it's so exciting. I mean, I just I just smile from the inside out when I think about what's happening in Aberystwyth. And for someone who, who does live near Aberystwyth, of course, it's wonderful. But there are massive benefits also to be connected to an, um, an academic uh, institution in you know somewhere else. It gives you a chance as a student to experience living somewhere else, um, you know, spending time there as a student. I, so um, I wouldn't be too I wouldn't be too concerned. I think if you've grown up near Aberystwyth and you want to be affiliated with with that university, which of course is understandable, it's not a bad thing to spend a little bit of time doing doing something somewhere else. You might settle where you live now, but it's good to spread your wings a little bit. So there's massive benefits to being connected to um, to uh, the Royal Veterinary College, but there's also massive benefits, I should say, for the Royal Veterinary College be connected to Aberystwyth for all those reasons of the range of subjects that are taught at Aberystwyth and the opportunity, the beautiful location, um, you know, all of that is fantastic. Plus access to farm animals, um, much, much more access than if you're living in Camden Town or Potter's Bar in, in London or Hertfordshire. So the, the hook up there, it's like a marriage made in heaven as far as I can see, where students get loads of opportunities. And uh, I, you know, I think you need to keep an open mind about that. Yeah, I can echo that. Sorry, just a personal anecdote. I spent some time at Aberystwyth and I did my research at another institution, but the supervisor realised how beneficial that two-centred approach was for me. Sorry, Daryl. No, no problem at all. And I, I agree fully with what Christiane said and the example you've just given. And just to create some assurance for um thinking of applying, but he's worried about the two-centre approach. And one of the concerns that's been expressed when I've been talking to particularly um, school applicants is that they say to me, oh, isn't it going to be difficult fitting into the RVC? Because Aberyst was a small university, there's a small class, how will I fit in? And I point out to them that all students at the Royal Vet College, when they start in their third year, are starting on a new campus. And the reason is that for the first two years at the RVC, if you had applied to RVC and been accepted from year one, your first two years are in the center of London. And then from your third year, you go to Hawkshead, which is the main campus just north of the M25. So it means that if you're from Aberystwyth, it doesn't really matter because you're going to be as new as somebody who of London starting at a new campus. And that's quite reassuring for people who might be a bit nervous about mm. the split approach. Good point. And I speak from experience. I, I, I did that because I was at London. I know what it feels like, yeah. Great. Well, you know what? Our time is up. I can't <laughs> believe that. We could be going on and on. We've got some great questions, but and I know you'd be wonderful at answering them, but I've really enjoyed listening to both of you this afternoon. Um, the versatility of the subject shines out to me. It's been precious time and all the best with everything that's happening within your industry. And you're such wonderful ambassadors for that. Over the last two days, you've had the opportunity to attend four different masterclasses. But if you wish to see more, the series of masterclass content will be available to you to view after the conference is finished. The conference has hopefully helped give you a feel for what it might be like to study the different subjects at university level. I'm Siri Viverio Etonal. It's now time to use the next 15 minutes to reflect on all the masterclasses you've seen over the two days and build on the masterclass reflection resources you used yesterday. Osmai Hedi Chinaminoni, if you're just joining us today, these will have been sent to you previously or can be downloaded in the lobby area. Akveli Nochir Lobby Ulaurulta. Reflect upon which masterclass you enjoyed most. Bisi Mindach Breed. Which big ideas and research would you like to be a part of investigating when you go to university? Yna, nôl i'r brif stafell i wybod mwy am heno. I'll see you back in the main room at 3.35 for some final instructions before this evening.